Cool. Well, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Um, I am a huge Loki fan, so this is a delight for me. Um, and I'll just dive right in. So at the um, at the end of season one of Loki, kind of the huge question around Sylvie is like, what is she going to do next? Right? She's accomplished her goal. She's won. And I remember there was this funny story that came out where I guess you were talking to one of the producers and you said, oh, well, I guess she'd probably be hungry, <laughs> you know, after killing a villain. And apparently they took that to heart. So what was your reaction when you got to when you got the script and you finally got to find out what Sylvie's next move was going to be? I, I'm like, oh, they took that literally. <laughs> oh, OK. Right. OK. Be careful what you say in future. So. <laughs> uh oh. Um, no, it was cool. It was funny. It was an interesting starting point, you know, and it's kind of mm. made sense. It's, it plops her straight into normal life and and you have to watch how Sylvie attempts to assimilate and and, and tries to, you know, make some human connections, um, which is something that she's never been able to do before. Um, and she's a real fish out of water, which is fun to start off with. And then you know, she manages to, she manages to create some kind of normal life there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously that's put under threat quite quickly. So. Of course. If you continue, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, what's in, so interesting about her life there and what I've seen kind of people commenting on is the fact that she, she seems to have friends everywhere, but I think even you yourself have said they're always like the people behind the counter, right? Like they're these people, she she knows the record store guy, she knows the guy at the bar, um, but she does seem to have, she doesn't seem to make like any close connections. No. So how did you explore that aspect of her character? I think um, Sylvie can't trust um, mm. or be trusted. So she's making connections with people in a very transactionary way is there's always a counter in between them it's safe for her she knows they're not going to hurt her she knows she's not going to have to kill them it's interesting actually how it parallels he who remains being sat behind his desk and how she moves it out of the way to kill him that's very that yeah first time <laughs> um but she yeah she's unable to make those connections because she she's too scared and she, no matter how vulnerable she makes herself, she just can't do it. And I think that's the tragedy of Sylvie. She knows, she, you know, in that record store scene where everything's disappearing, she knows that she can never be truly content or happy as a as a regular human might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was actually going to ask about that scene because that's, that's such a fascinating, uh, like, kind of whole sequence of events. You know, you mentioned like she like pulls the desk away from he who remains. And then in season two, we see Loki actually like trying to reestablish that connection, right? Like they're both on the same side of the bar. He's kind of reaching out to her and she leaves, you know. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah right? she does. Yeah. And I think he she's trying to help him in a way. I think mm -hmm. she's trying to say fight for what you want and what you believe in and you know you need to write your own story mm -hmm. and, and he does in the end it's all it's like tough love i think right yeah 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 that's interesting but it's still yeah but she still can't make that connection so yeah, yeah. She walks away so, I mean, speaking of Sylvie's relationship uh, with Loki, I mean, obviously, I don't know if you were following kind of fan conversations, but that's always been a hot topic, right? Like, oh, do they belong together? Do they not? Do this and that. Um, how did you and Tom work together with, the, you know, the writers and the directors to flesh out that that relationship that they have? Um, well, they're, all, they're variants of each other. So we always came from the 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 school of belief that they're they're the same being and they're and that they it's that series one if anything is a story about sort of self-acceptance and self-love mm -hmm. um, and you know about all the romance stuff i think that's a a cool sort of um um theory but i it's not something <laughs> we ever truly followed it's more about how they're going to be connected mm -hmm. um, f forever in a way but it's in such a particular strange way they're, they're the same person 
they know right. each other more than anything, more than anyone, but they're also completely different and know exactly how to wind each other up. So it's a very intimate relationship, but it's not necessarily romantic. That's how I think of it. And that's how we talked about it on set. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I mean, it makes that kiss at the end of season one so fraught, right? Like, does she mean it? Is she tricking him? You know, that's such a cool moment. Yeah. Exactly. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, kind of like the physical aspects of the way you play Sylvie. Um, in season one, she's a brawler, right? She's she's very physical. She's a fighter. In season two, we don't see as much of that, but she's still got this toughness about her. You know, she wears that muscle shirt. She's got that mullet, <laughs> you know. Uh, she's got that gigantic pickup truck. Which is, it's funny. It's so American, <laughs> you know. Um, so how did you, what did you bring to that aspect of, of her role? How did you develop that part of her? That was really fun. Yeah. Well, I guess we were given the year 1982. So <laughs> we stayed within the parameters of that. Um, and yeah, she's, she's always, Sophie's a badass and she's a bit punk and she's a bit like alternative and she's always going to be comfy. She's always going to mm -hmm. be cool. Um, she's never, you're never going to see Sylvie in a pair of high heels or <laughs> tight clothing. So yeah. it's always sort of androgynous and comfy and cool. And that's, that just carried on in, in, in series, uh, in series two, um, and working with, um, Christine Wada and, um, mm -hmm. Wacker, the, the hair designer, um, they had really clear ideas about what they wanted to do, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it worked really well. The boots though, the, her boots are the same. So the boots are the same in series one and series two. Oh, interesting. Yeah, <laughs> always the same boots. <laughs> well, and even like her armor, like it, see, it seems like she has made like modifications to it. Like there's, I, I got to see it at Comic-Con, there's like safety pins in it and kind yeah. of, cool. did, did you imagine like kind of Sylvie sat there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because in series two, she's sort of having a bit of an identity crisis. And <laughs> I likened it to, you know, when you go to college or university or sort of you grow up and move out of your parents' home, you have that moment where you're terrified of the mm -hmm. real world, but you're quite aggressively trying to find out who you are. Um, and you try all this new stuff. You get mm -hmm. pierced or tattooed or you dye your hair pink. I did all of the above. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it's Sylvie's way of doing that is putting her mark on, you know, trying to figure out who she is and who she wants to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I was wondering if we could shift gears a little bit. So I'm a mother of two. And I remember during season one, um, I, like I so appreciated your advocacy around motherhood and working moms, right? Like right down to the, you know, the nursing friendly costume that you had Christine Wada design for you. Um, what was it like going into season two uh, with kids and being a working mom? It's the hardest thing. <laughs> the hard no one can ever prepare you for how hard it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I did it again. So yeah, I had a baby again for series two. So it was just insane. Um, and I'm like, what am I doing? Um, but everyone was super supportive and I'm very lucky that, you know, I have a job where mm -hmm. it's, they help you as much as they can, you know, to, yeah. to be a parent and to also do your job. Um, but yeah, the nursing friendly costume was whipped out again and everything was put into place again. So I could, you know, feed the baby and then do a scene and, you, you know, it's just, it's just a circus. It's so, it's so crazy. And just the balance of, of life and work and parenting is, mm -hmm. it, it should be easier. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Yeah, well, I imagine it's it's especially difficult um, with a like with an acting schedule because there's so much travel and kind of you, you know unpredictable scheduling involved. Like, I mean, I basically work a nine to five, but for you, I imagine it's quite different. It's crazy, but it's also like people ask me about it a lot, and I don't think people ask like my husband about it. Yeah. <laughs> right the moms always get asked about how do you do it how do you juggle work and life and parenting mm -hmm. and 
like all the guys are doing it too. Right. It, it's, 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 um, we just do it because we have to, you mm -hmm. know, pay bills and do our job. Yeah. Yeah. De I mean, absolutely. <laughs> I definitely feel that. Yeah. Um, well, so, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, so I would love to also talk about um, some of your behind the camera work because I know you're also a writer and a director. Um, I, I'm a horror fan, and so I especially love uh, the lost films of Bloody Nora. Mm -hmm. uh, what draws you to writing and directing? Like, what excites you about that aspect of this work? Just a control freak. I just really <laughs> like being in control of my everything mm -hmm. and a little part of my life. Um, no, it's I love photography and I um, I love telling stories. So whenever I write something, I imagine how it's going to be shot. With the Lost Films of Bloody Nora, it's just like a weird, dark fairy tale, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just wanted to mess about with an old camera and see what happened and just, you know, hang out with my mates and make a silly film. It's just like a fun, creative thing to do. I guess it's like my weird little hobby. <laughs> <laughs> sure. What drew you to, uh, um, I mean, how did the story come up? Like you, you described it as like a weird little thing, but was there like a kernel for that idea? I'm trying to remember, it was so long ago. Mm. I think I found that camera. Actually, my brother-in-law found a camera on, uh -huh train he worked for the train on the train lines he found a camera and he gave it to me because he knows that I like old cameras and mm. films. um and I was like, I'm gonna shoot something on this um and then I <sighs> bought some costumes and I, I, and it just came from getting dressed up getting mm. dressed up and I have a huge costume box in my house and we do a lot of dressing up and coming up with weird little characters um <laughs> the creative process is probably quite weird <laughs> um, and then yeah me and my friend will hankey who's a fantastic director of photography and also a massive nerd like with like hand processing film and stuff like me we just mm -hmm. geeked out for a few days so yeah. made it went along and then i think i was like, would it be cool if like she eats the film and then he has to like get it out of her stuff? Like that could be the 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 opening um, shot is like she is mm -hmm. like bleeding and all of this film is being taken out like spaghetti from her inside, you know. And then it just yep. snowballed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it sounds like your creative process is very playful, right? Like, would you would you say that's true? Yeah, I think so. Finding what's fun and what's gross mm. what looks cool yeah to tie it back to loki were there any uh were there any, any moments of, like that on set where you were like where you were able to kind of like find sylvie's character or find your way to the heart of a scene just through play and creativity and experimenting yeah i think that's how i always approach the character is through play and experimenting what for sylvie it's very physical for me like the way she fights and the way she stands so before a scene to get into character, I will often just do a bit of fight choreo, like on my own in the toilet. Mm. Um, so like, just like do some air punching and and sort of physically become her um, and just imagine fighting. That's how I access Sylvie. Sure, um, yeah. Every part. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Thinking about your like you you know your upcoming projects and the future of your work, both Marvel and non Marvel, um, I know you've spoken in the past about just kind of like fun things you could imagine Sylvie doing, characters that you would want her to meet up with. Um, if Marvel came to you and they said we're giving Sylvie a solo film or a solo series, what would you hope to see in it? Like, where would you hope for her to go? Oh gosh, I don't know, like a beach somewhere, smoking a cigar. <laughs> she deserves I'm it. what I say now Julia because last time I said hamburger and look where that got me yeah <laughs> right she would be on a Caribbean island smoking a cigar <laughs> like barbecue and some like great music play <laughs> <laughs> yeah right maybe like a million dollars we could throw that in <laughs> yeah 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 
all my friends, all my family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a right, well, fraught question, I understand. How about um, the other projects that are coming up? What are you working on right now? Um, I have a film called The Radleys, which is coming out um, with Damien Lewis and Kelly McDonald, and then um, a series called Peacock um, in the UK. Um, yeah, and a few more things which will be coming soon. Yeah, the Radleys. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I is the I feel like vampires are involved. Yeah. In this. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So can, is there anything you can say about it? It's it's a suburban vampire story about a family of vampires who are trying to abstain from drinking any blood. Oh, good. Well, responsible vampires. Yeah, so. responsible <laughs> vampires in like Yorkshire, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as we wrap up, um, this is like a fl fun little question I like to ask sometimes. If you could meet Sylvie in person, um, what would you tell her? Like, what would you say to her? Oh, God. That's a really good question. Um, I think I'd just say, just keep what, doing what you're doing. You're a mm. badass. And I wish I could be more like you. Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for chatting with me today. This was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Cheers. You too. Yeah.